six extraordinary weeks that turned politics upside down, taking down a chancellor and a prime minister. Some mistakes were made. But looking back now, with markets almost back to normal, you could be forgiven for wondering, hang on, did that really all happen? Was it all just a dream? Actually, this crisis was far more complicated than the coverage at the time might have suggested. The root causes run far deeper, and most worrying, it might just have been a tremor ahead of an earthquake to come. But let's start with the conventional story, the one you've probably heard before. It begins here at the Treasury on the 23rd of September. Kwasi Kwarteng has just fired the chief civil servant, and then comes the mini-budget, an unfunded set of tax cuts which causes the UK to lose its credibility and markets to go into a tailspin. The pound fell to the lowest level against the dollar ever. Yields, the implied interest rate on government debt, rocketed. The overriding feeling was one of uncertainty and there was a lot of, I think, uh, fear and panic. Looking at the screen and seeing, you know, bond yields rising five basis points, ten basis points, and it was just you know, it started to get really out of control. Lenders were changing things, sometimes hourly, sometimes you get noticed, sometimes you wouldn't. It was a chain reaction, sweeping through UK markets and coursing into pensions and mortgages. It was the speed and scale of the rise in interest rates um, which was problematic. Things that would ordinarily happen over the space of, you know, several weeks, you know, demands were being made in, in a matter of hours. So in order to raise cash, they were forced to sell, you know, things like government bonds. But the problem was they were selling government bonds when the prices were falling. And then the price was falling further because lots of pension schemes were doing it at the same time. For a few terrifying days, these problems in the market that underlies the pensions industry threatened to cause a total meltdown. The impact of that, you know, these Government bond yields are the benchmark for borrowing costs throughout the wider economy. Still standing. So the Bank of England stepped into the breach. It was a very intense period. There was a lot of midnight oil burnt in this building. Um, but we knew that our you know, we knew our responsibilities. We knew our responsibility for financial stability in this country and that we had to act. Even as the bank acted, out there in the real world, those higher market interest rates were feeding through into the prices being offered by mortgage brokers. We saw rates increasing on average about 2-2.5% two, two overnight, which was very dramatic when you transfer that into actual everyday pound coins and what's that expenditure for a client. And finally, it ended up in the real world with real painful consequences. This is Rusty. In early October, he saw a property he fell in love with. But in the three days between seeing it and getting his offer accepted, his mortgage costs went up from £1,000 a month to £1,400 an increase of £5,000 a year, all because of the market mayhem. It, it was a massive change and a shock at first, and I'll be honest, I had to decide, do I want to change my standard of living? What do I want to give up for this property? It could be £1,500 tomorrow, right? So it was, a bit, it was a bit of a risk. You buy it now or you don't, you know? So um, the fact that it was that external shock was really frustrating. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me was that it was the first time when public policy really affected my life. This is the first and most important point. What just happened wasn't just numbers on a screen, it had real consequences. Unfortunate consequences, says the governor. But what about those families who have already refixed their mortgages at really high rates in the last few weeks? Well, I have a great deal of sympathy for them because I think it's that just unfortunate. This is, is it? very unfortunate what has happened. They were just victims of what collateral damage of the chaos that we've well, seen. Well, there was in a the period. Of, there was a period of very substantial instability, which, which of course, you know, we and others have had to deal with. Do you feel like you've been betrayed by the prime hello, minister? Hello, thank you. But that's only the beginning of it because those higher rates also led to well, something else. Something you probably remember. They claimed the scalp of the Chancellor and then his boss. Financial markets effectively decided the fate of a Prime Minister, yes, following some mistakes in Whitehall, yes, amid a backdrop of volatility, but even so, it represents a watershed moment 
for the UK. And not just that, the former Greek finance minister, no stranger to crises himself, says the UK's drama created contagion in other markets, including America. He was advised that markets were very nervous and then said, well, markets are going to do what they do. I mean, is, was, he, was he even more maverick than you? It was just very bad timing by Liz Truss and Guazi Cardin to issue uh, a budget that um, essentially uh, allowed the guilt market, the British, the UK-based uh, uh, government uh, debt market, to add to the volatility in the United States. And, you know, th something was going to break. And I very much fear that it was the turn of the UK to do to the rest of the G7, to the advanced countries, what Greece had done in 2010 to the Eurozone countries. And the markets uh, called them out. And it's not as if they weren't warned by the very people advising them. We said markets are in a very febrile state. If your policy actions are not clear and not understood, there will be a market crisis. So you, you warned very explicitly about this risk. Did you? I said this publicly and privately, that you needed to convince the markets that any fiscal action was necessary, not inflationary and affordable. And did they do that? No. And that, more or less, is the conventional story. That the government was a victim of its own mistakes. That the faceless investors in the city and beyond were simply reacting to imprudent economic policy from an impetuous new government. And there's a lot in that. But there's another, more controversial interpretation. Some are asking, wasn't someone else responsible here? What about the Bank of England? Weren't they too slow to raise interest rates? Wasn't the fatal moment for Liz Truss when Andrew Bailey withdrew his support for the bond market? If so, that would make this the key intervention. You've got three days left now. You've got to get this done. When he appeared at an event in Washington and imposed that deadline. The message was ostensibly for pension schemes to wind up their affairs, but three days later, the Chancellor was gone, shortly followed by the Prime Minister. Brighter days lie ahead. Thank you. And some influential financiers are whispering that actually, maybe it was the bank which really sealed the Prime Minister's fate. Then again, the Governor is having none of it. I vehemently disagree with this because it is based on a fallacy. What that misses is that our intervention as a central bank, as it should be, was to address a precise financial stability problem. So I'm afraid had we gone on with that intervention beyond the point of financial stability being suitably restored, we'd have been creating another problem, which is a, you know, what economists tend to call a moral hazard problem, i.e. You know, people would say, well, the bank is always going to intervene, and that's wrong. You know, we did the job we set out to do. You didn't depose Liz Truss? No, no, of course we didn't depose Liz Truss. I would never do anything like that. The point, however, is that this wasn't so simple. Just as it's hard to disentangle the events of a half-forgotten dream, this story gets more complex the more you delve into it. It's easy to blame everything on Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, and they clearly stoked up a hornet's nest. But even if you discount the wilder stories about the Bank of England, there's something else going on here. The bank should have been seen as politically neutral. So the very fact that you're asking those questions, the economy and the financial markets have become used to cheap money. The worry is that as interest rates go higher, as they need to, to keep inflation in check, that will expose all sorts of economic and financial problems. If that's right, it means the genie didn't go back in the bottle when Liz Truss resigned. It means there could well be more trouble to come. The problems haven't, haven't gone away and, and, you know, you have to wonder, you know, perhaps this isn't just an isolated incident, but it could be the start of a trend. And, and you know, one thing that's particularly concerning to me is that there's a, an awful lot of debt in the system. In other words, while it's tempting to see this all as a story about Britain and its woes, what rippled out of the city this autumn might also have been about something else, a global system shuddering in the face of rising interest rates. You have your assets in, uh, in foreign currency and you have your liabilities in your own currency. Um, stop thinking of your, yourselves in Monty Python-esque terms as very exceptional. Um, this is my criticism of my British friends. Either you think that you're the best in the world or you think you're the worst in the world. Well, you're neither. So no, 
it wasn't a dream, it was very real. And the coming autumn statement will make that perfectly clear, higher taxes and lower public spending to clean up the mess. Except, what if our own parochial mess was only a fragment of the bigger narrative? As the world struggles to come to terms with the end of cheap money, the real story might only be beginning. <laughs>